It's a pleasure to have Marat Kirdar uh the brown bag today. Marat and his collaborators are from Turkey. Uh, these various universities are in Ankara. And this year, Marat is visiting at the Institute for Labor Research. I think it's on Channing. It's on Channing. It's on Channing. And uh, we're looking here. forward to hearing your talk. Okay. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, this is joint work with Matan Valiola and this Smith Coach. And uh, in this paper, we examine the uh, causal relationship between education and marriage and fertility decisions of teenage women in Turkey. And uh, the critical uh, thing uh, we are doing is we are after the causal effect of education on marriage and fertility decisions. And for this purpose, uh, we need an exogenous variation in education. And the exogenous variation that we use in education is the change in compulsory schooling in Turkey in 1997 from five to eight years. So we use this particular policy to find the effect of education, to find the causal effect of education on marriage and fertility decisions. And um, marriage and fertility decisions um, of teenage women is an important thing in Turkey because of the high teenage marriage and fertility rates. For instance, even in 2008, uh, more than 22% of 19-year-old women were already married. And um, yeah, this is despite the slogan. Actually, in 1993, it was even about 30%. So this is an important phenomenon in Turkey that we are examining. And the other important thing about marriage and uh, first birth or general fertility decisions in Turkey is that in the sociology literature, this uh, sequential uh, events, rigid sequence of events is reported in which uh, marriage takes place right after education and first birth takes place, again, immediately right after marriage. Uh, and in, uh, in the Turkish context, we also see this rigid sequence of events. Uh, so marriage comes right after schooling and first birth comes like on average 1.6 years after marriage. And this has not changed much over time. So it's really important to examine this marriage and fertility, in particular, first birth decisions together. So why do we care about this high level of teenage marriage and fertility rates? Um, because in the literature, a number of negative effects of teenage marriage and fertility has been reported. There, uh, there are negative labor market effects of teenage marriage, like on uh, work experience and market wages. Uh, this is well reported in the economics literature. And uh, there are also negative health effects of teenage marriage, like smoking and probability of being overweight. Um, in terms of uh, child health outcomes, the results are not as clear. There are some studies that show negative effects, but uh, this is not very conclusive. Also, there, uh, in the literature, um, negative intergenerational effects of teenage marriage and fertility are also reported. Like the children of teenage mothers uh, have some certain negative outcomes, like uh, lower educational attainments and lower earnings. Also, children of teenage mothers are reported to be more likely to engage in crime. Most of these negative associations in the U.S. or uh, oh, very, various countries, and like this is like various countries. Most of them are for the U.S. and developed countries. But, but are they relevant for Turkey? Uh, not necessarily, but I would expect. I mean, um, mm -hmm. these are reported for many different countries, so uh, they could be relevant for Turkey. But I cannot really point out any studies for Turkey. So in terms of the conceptual framework, uh, what is the relation, how does education has a bearing on marriage and fertility decisions? So in the literature, we basically we can uh, think of the effect of education on marriage through two different channels. 
One is what the sociologists call institutional effect, or that's called like it's called incarceration effect in the economics literature. <laughs> Basically, by <laughs> yeah, putting the by putting the kids, in particular the girls, into school. Basically, you prevent them from getting married and therefore uh, giving birth. And um, in, because the basic idea is that schooling and marriage are incompatible events. This is especially true in Turkey because marriage entails certain cores and so forth. They are incompatible events and uh, therefore we have this incarceration effect. Um, obviously, institution effect has a timing eff effect. Uh, like it delays the time. Once you're, after, you're out of the institution, uh, things are different. But there's a, also a human capital effect reported in the literature. We can also think about this within the Becker's marriage model, in which um, your marriage de decisions depends on the gains from specialization in the marriage. As women acquire higher levels of schooling, and their potential wages in the labor market increase, the returns from marriage and specialization in, from marriage goes down, and therefore they become less likely to marry. Education also has a bearing on fertility. The uh, first channel is obviously through marriage. From the previous slide, I told you about previous channels how education could affect marriage. By affecting marriage timing, it will also affect the, fertil the timing of fertility. This is especially so in Turkey because marriage is like a prerequisite for fertility. This wouldn't be the case in the US or other developed countries, but delaying the time to marriage also delays the time to the first birth. There's also like the other ones are basically how the human capital effect potentially operates. Basically, by acquiring a higher level of education, women's potential wages in the market increases, so the opportunity cost of giving birth and rearing kids increases. Also, uh, in the economics literature, it's reported that a better knowledge of contraceptives may come with higher education. So if women acquire better knowledge of contraceptives, after they get married, the time, they could change the timing of their births. And it could also affect the fertility decisions. The other thing is that in the literature, it's also reported that education lowers infant mortality rates. Actually, this is true for Turkey as well, on which I myself studied. So by lowering the uh, infant mortality rates, uh, the number of births the number of pregnancies that are required for the uh, desired number of children decreases. Obviously, this wouldn't affect the time to the first birth, but this could affect the total, fertile, the total number of births. In this paper, we are looking at the time to first birth. So this is not a potential channel in our case. And also, higher birth in the sociology literature, it's reported that higher, bar higher education may lead to higher bargaining power within the family. And that could also change the fertility decisions, fertility levels. But this also makes the assumption that women may want fewer than men. So these are the potential channels. So what we do in this paper? In this paper, we use the effect of this education policy. And the particular uh, outcomes that we look at are the following. We first look at the ever married status by age. We, look, we do the analysis by age levels. And again, by taking each age, we look at the um, ever given birth status. Then these are, these are in what you call in demography the quantum effects, like the levels. We also look at the tempo effects, like the timing of marriage and fertility. And we look at the probability of getting married by age conditional on not, not being married by that age. We look at the same thing by, uh, for birth. So we'll, we look at the timing effect. And the final thing we look at is, we look at the time until first birth after the woman gets married. OK? So and uh, the Turkish context is a really good uh, case study for studying these things, because marriage is uh, 
almost universal. E almost everybody gets married. So it's really uh, a good context to study, effect, to study the effect of education on marriage decisions, like unlike the Western context where cohabitation is more prevalent. Uh, the other thing is, as I told you, we look at the timing to first birth after marriage. This also doesn't make sense in the Western setting because obviously marriage is not a prerequisite for fertility. But in the Turkish context, it makes a lot of sense to look at the time until first birth after a woman gets married. So I just want to show you some graphs of the education policy before we move on, some numbers. But before that, uh, let me tell you about the education policy and the system of education in Turkey so that we can understand the effect of the policy. So schooling is like three levels. Primary school is the first five grades. Secondary school, grades six to eight. And high school, grades nine to 11. Before the policy, only primary school was mandatory. Only five years were mandatory until 1997. But after the policy in 1997, uh, Secondary school, grades 6 to 8, were also made mandatory. So the changes for grades 6, 7, and 8. Basically, these two schooling levels were connected under the name of primary education. Okay? Uh, the other important thing is it's not like the U.S. Even though like five years is mandatory before 1997, or eight years are mandatory, you would see many kids who do not comply. Actually, the, there is enforcement mechanisms like penalties, and the teachers are supposed to do certain things, but it's not enforced perfectly. Okay, So it also makes the case interesting. Um, the other thing is, the policy was uh, implemented in 1997. According to the rules, we assume that the policy affected kids who were born in 1987 and afterwards. Basically, it affected kids who started school in 1993 or afterwards. We are assuming that kids start school at age six, so it affects cohorts born in 1987 and afterwards. But I see it roughly because, again, unlike the US, the age for starting school is not very strongly implemented. Most kids start at age six, but in rural areas, some kids may start at age seven. Some kids may start at age five, which is rare. So I say roughly 1987. Some, 19, some kids who are born in 1987 may not be affected by the policy if they started early. Or some who were born in 1986 could be affected by the policy. Uh, uh, the ones who start like. But roughly we see the break. Actually, maybe the graph is going to help me much better. So this is the fraction completed 13 years of schooling over time. These are the year of birth cohorts. So the upper line is completion of five years of schooling, which was compulsory before the policy as well. That's relatively flat. Actually, it's not that flat for women, as you see. It's not perfect compliance even before the policy. And there's a time trend. This is the critical one. Great uh, finishing year eight, eight years of schooling, secondary school. See, this is before the policy with some time trend, but see what happens around 1987, there's a big jump. And this is even stronger for women because the starting levels are lower for women. The other interesting thing is that Look at the high school completion ones, 11 years. High Again, there's a trend, but there's also a jump here. And this is despite the fact that high school was not mandatory. Actually, in a companion paper, we look at just the re analyze the effect on education uh, in detail. This policy had a huge impact on high school completion rates as well. Even though it was not forced, many kids, like who were forced to finish grade eight by the policy, actually went home to complete high school, which even though it wasn't required. And you see the similar effect for women. So basically, we want to use this jump, which is forced, like it's not a, ch a choice by the individuals, so it's, not in, it's exogenous. We want to use this jump. But the other issue is there's a time trend as well. 
So in the empirical analysis, it's going to be critical to disentangle this time effect from the effect of the policy. Because even without the policy, schooling rates would go up. Okay? So I showed the number for numbers for men, even though I'm interested in the marriage and fertility decisions for women, but obviously marriage and fertility decisions are made jointly, right? In particular the fertility decisions. So it's not only the women's schooling that is changing the fertility, but also men's because their potential husbands also have a higher level of education because of this policy. Is so, there much of an age gap between the husband and wife? I, I don't know exactly how much it is. Yeah, your concern is that like some girls may be affected, but their potential husbands may not be affected. Yeah. Especially for the ones who are just born right after the policy, like 87, 88 birth cohorts, yeah. It's probably, probably two years. We're, we're, almost all societies, it seems could to be, be like the better. Yeah, 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 my empirical no, thing is like, yeah. Probably some deep truth. <laughs> the other interesting thing about the policy is that, obviously it has a different effect on different demographic groups. Like here, I divide, <coughs> I look at it by mother's education. So the part A, when mothers do not have compulsory schooling, which is a lot in Turkey for these generations, and when mothers have compulsory schooling or not. And as you see, the effect of the policy is stronger on mothers who have less than compulsory schooling because the starting levels are low. Same thing for fathers, like this is Father has less than compulsory schooling. The levels are like less than 20% for completing eight years of schooling. But it goes up all the way to 80%. For when fathers have compulsory schooling or more, the increase is not as much. Okay? So the education policy affects certain groups more than the other groups. Okay? And in that case, we would expect the for marriage and fertility decisions of women whose mothers or fathers have low levels of education, for those people, we would expect a stronger effect on marriage and fertility because the schooling effect is stronger as well. I'm sorry, I, I may have missed it. How are you measuring how much schooling the girls get? Um, oh, it's in the data. Uh, I'm going to explain the data as well, but uh, it's, yeah. we have the years of schooling completed. From self-report? Uh, Self-report if the woman is above 15. Uh, mother's report if sh she is less than 15. Thank you. So this is the this is what we are, this is the critical graph. This is the marriage the pro the fraction that is married by birth cohorts by birth cohorts the fraction that is married by birth cohorts and by age. Okay, for instance, let's look at this. Women who are 14 years old. For the 1978 birth court, something like 2.5 is married. 2.5% is married. It goes over time, but like the vertical line is where the policy comes in effect. You see the drop right after the policy. Okay, here for age 15, it's also more obvious, also maybe for age 13. But the other thing when you look at in these graphs is the strong time effect, right? It was going down in any way. It was going down in any way. So it's really, it's going to be really important to be able to distinguish this time effect from the effect of the policy. So it's the same graph, but now this is only for women whose mothers have less than compulsory school. This is the subgroup of the previous graph. These are women whose mothers have low levels of schooling. I told you that these women's education levels were affected even more. And we would expect the effect on marriage to be stronger, right? And in fact, it's stronger. Like the drop here, the drop here, like if you compare the two graphs, for instance, look at this and compare with this. It's stronger. Also here, if you look at it, like, oh, I went to the wrong side. 
direction. Look at 15. Now it's stronger. So in fact, for the group that we expect the effect of the policy to be stronger, we find a stronger effect on marriage outcomes. <coughs> and this is the graph for first birth. And in this case, for first birth, there are strong In some ages, the effect can be seen stronger. In some ages, it's not as obvious because of the time effects, because the time effects are quite strong as well. Any questions so far? Oh. Well, how were the lines drawn in those previous graphs? Uh, these ones? Yeah. Uh, these, like, these are the actual levels. The dots are actual levels. Yeah. This is a non-parametric smoothing. What it does is basically takes them locally. It runs local <laughs> regressions and combines them. There are no low S or something. Low like S, low S smoothing. What? Is it only for the first Puzzling. It seems that in many cases the line is either flat or actually going up right before the policy. It, it's I, I mean, these are yeah. like this. I'm, I'm not taking them really literally each. You know, there's a lot of error. Like some, there's a lot of sampling error yeah. in this case. But also, these are like as you say, very as you say, very low probabilities. I mean, yeah. at early ages, yeah. these are really low probability events. So it's very normal that there's a lot of bumps, right. there's a lot of sampling error. Right. And, you know, just, I, I don't let the yeah, it's very noisy. Yeah. Very noisy. It's very noisy because <laughs> it's a low probability <laughs> event. Okay. One, one thing you could have done, and, and it would really show up on the previous picture, I, I think, on uh, the previous slide, you could fit that thing to the left of the line, leave the data out at the line where your discontinuity happens, and then fit it to the right. And see the gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That actually instead of basically it. what you say, instead of smoothing all of it, right. smooth separately on the left and the theory tells you it should be separate on the left and the right. And the, and th the thing is, because also like this is not a very sharp discontinuity. No, no, I understand, but that's why you want to leave out maybe maybe you want to leave out 80, uh, 87 and eighty eight, which I do in the which I do in the econometric analysis. Exactly. So then I the mean, lines. This is to just to give idea. I mean, these are just to give you some idea. I'll do all of what you said in the econometric analysis. Yep. This is just to give the idea. Also, the interesting thing is like here. For the low educated woman, you see that the effect is stronger. So we also have this intergroup, intergroup compar comparison. These are just to give some ideas. Also, before going into the details, I want to uh, show where the, our papers stand in the literature, on the empirical literature on this topic. So the empirical literature on the effect of education and marriage and fertility uh, generally looks at the correlations. It doesn't look at the causality because it's really hard to find an exogenous change in schooling. There have been a number of studies who look at the causal effect of uh, education on marriage and for certain marriage and for fertility outcomes. The first one is for the US and they look at the effect of education on the probability of marriage but they do not find it. They look at like the total human capital, whether there's a total human capital effect, but they find no effect. And the instrument they use is this birth month instrument popularized by Angrist. Um, the second study published in demography, actually a relatively recent study, they find effects of education on timing, timing of marriage and fertility, but they do not have effect on the levels. Uh, this is for Sweden. And they, the instrument they use is also birth month. Okay? Um, and in the last study, they do, uh, do it for Norway. They also find the timing effect, but no level effects. And they use extension of compulsory schooling as well. And the final important study is the one by Black Ever and Salones, done for the US and Norway. And this study, like ours, also focuses on teenage years, and they find a negative effect on teenage childbearing. For developing countries, as expected, the number of studies are fewer. Uh, there's a study for Nigeria published in the Journal of Development Economics. 
And the impact find that additional year of schooling reduces the number of children born by age 25. And they also use the variation in compulsory schooling across regions. And this is a structural paper, not like an instrumental variables paper like these are. Um, uh, and in Malaysia, uh, that's, uh, they find that age at first marriage also is affected by education. So how our study compares to these studies? Like in our study, we just look at the teenage marriage and fertility. In that sense, it's similar to Black Devil and Salvanes. But the critical difference of our study is we look at marriage and first birth together. Many of these studies just look at the fertility decisions, but we look at the marriage and uh, fertility decisions together. But the critical difference of our study is our instrument. Like in the literature, none of these studies use, like basically we are luckier than they are. None of these studies use as, as strong instrument as ours. Like this birth month instruments basically change schooling really little in the US. Like only uh, because uh, the children who, who quit after compulsory schooling is really few in the US. It doesn't change much. Also in the, in the Scandinavian studies, even though they use compulsory schooling years, again, the study, the changes in education is not as much. Like as I showed you in our case, the changes in education, which I'm also going to show is huge. And also in the study that like they use differences across regions in compulsory schooling. In this case, the randomness of the instrument is a question, but uh, which is not the case in our study. <coughs> so going into the details of the study, we use the 2003 and 2008 waves of the Turkish demographic and health surveys. You know, the DHS studies from other countries probably. Um, the good thing is you, many of you are familiar with these data sets. There is detailed information of, on marriage and fertility as well as certain uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the women. Because the, uh, basically the target is 15 to 49 year old females. Um, we restrict this sample to 1964 to 1998 birth cohorts. Because 1998 is obvious because in 2008 they are 10 years old. Like this is the youngest generation we take. And we do sensitivity checks with this. Basically the earliest we could go could be 1954. And we take kids, we take his birth cohorts from age 10 to age 21. We look at, at each age and in duration analysis we pull that. Obviously, the birth courts, we have also changes by age. For 10 years old, we have 64 to 1998. For 15 years old, we have 64 to 93. And for 20 years old, we have 64 to 88. So descriptive statistics, quickly, there's not too much interesting. These are basically the characteristics of the women that we're using in our empirical analysis. One critical thing is the type of place of residence at age 12. One other good thing about DHS is that we know where they live at age 12. So we know the location when they make schooling decisions. Uh, we know mother's mother thumb, basically it's a control for ethnicity. And we know mother's educational attainment. Also, one thing that is striking is the low levels of mother's education, especially for those courts. There are huge generational differences, but for the mothers of these people, these are the mothers of these people, like people born in 30s, 40s, 50s maybe, the level of education is very low. So the key variable of interest that we're looking at, for this sample, what is the fraction that is married and what is the fraction that has given birth by age? And by age 15, almost 7% is already married. By age 18, almost 30% is already married. In, and in terms of birth, like by age 17, 9% has given birth. And by age 20, almost 7 Are there any minimum age marriage laws in 
Turkey. Yeah, yeah. There is actually, but uh, I mean, it's not binding because the marriage law is for civil marriages. There are also religious marriages that are possible. And basically, at age 12, a girl can get married under religious law. Actually, it's also available in DHS. But when you look at the data for these teenage marriages, a lot of, a lot of are just religious marriages. Then they, once they get to the regular age, they get the civil marriage, or even afterwards, if they need it. What is the minimum civil? Uh, minimum? The minimum is the civil marriage? And it used to be 15, now it's 17. But again, there are laws with the consent of the families, it could go down to 16. But they are not really binding. Actually, in an earlier version of this, we examined that better. Uh, that has an effect, but no. And it makes very much sense because early marriages are generally religious marriages anyway. So, in terms of <coughs> the empirical methodology, so the idea, as you saw in the schooling graph, is basically using the variation in the exposure to the policy across birth cohorts. 1987 and afterwards, both course 87 and afterwards are affected by the policy before they are not affected by the policy. We use this variation and we use, this is a jargon in economics, we use a regression discontinuity design. Basically the idea is we have this jump but the outcome variable, marriage and birth, are also affected by time itself. There's a secular time trend in these things. Basically to separate these two effects from the time effect, uh, the effect of the policy, we use this regression discontinuity design, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So the control variables in the uh, analysis are the education policy, obviously, the key variable of interest, one after 87, zero before 87. The other thing is the linear time trend. That's how we distinguish the effect of the policy from the secular time trend. We assume that schooling, marriage, and probability of first birth all go down over time. Schooling goes up, and the other two goes, go down in a linear way. Okay? We need to make this linearity assumption. I'm going to show you in a minute whether this linearity assumption is a good assumption. Okay, we assume a linear time trend. An alternative would be a, like a quadratic or cubic, but a linear is necessary to distinguish the effect because the effect, because of this uh, fuzziness around 87, we need a really linear effect. Because of the fuzziness, a quadratic could capture the policy. It's dangerous to use a quadratic because of the fuzziness around 87. So the other controls, as I told you, Ethnicity, location, and mother's educational attainment. <coughs> so, as I said, is it safe to <coughs> assume linear trends? So this is the schooling over time. As you see, they're not far from linear. For this, for this case, linearity is a decent assumption. What about marriage and fertility? This is the fraction married, let's say, age 16, 17, and 18, over time. Again, the trends are not so much away from linear. Obviously, the exception is early ages, where there's a lot of noise, because the probabilities are really, really low. But for the later ages after 13, the trends are actually linear is a quite good approximation. Same thing for the fraction that has given birth. Linearity doesn't seem to be a bad assumption. Okay, so, so any question here? Yeah. Well, it's a little troubling though if uh -huh. the if your estimated effects go away if you assume linear uh, quadratic time trends because if the linear is a good fit then it shouldn't make that much difference when you introduce the quadratic term. But, I the, would have but the thing is, like the graph is like this. Yeah, it's not this. Mm -hmm. Because of this, you know, fuzziness around it, a quadratic captures the fuzziness. Actually, in, in these regression discontinuity designs, they actually discuss this. When it is like this, mm -hmm. actually when you put quadratic, it captures the effect of the policy. Because it fits this 
smooth rise as well as the smooth slowing down. Actually, they you know warn against using a quadratic in that case. Mm -hmm. It still leaves me uncomfortable. I must say. <laughs> the thing is, like if I really get rid of the middle ones, yeah. and if I use quadratic, it it would be fine. Mm -hmm. Like if I get rid of run 87, maybe three years, like mm -hmm. three years right, if I get rid of like this and run it, quadratic would be fine as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, if you know the distribution of starting ages at school, like, you know, most people start when they're six, but there's a distribution of age, can you deconvolve that effect out of? There could be other reasons, yeah. The, the, you could, it would be hard, but that it's not the only reason. The other reason is that the implementation of the policy wasn't very sharp as well. Like 97 days started, but like in 1998 it was even stronger because they were not really able to open the things at the beginning. You see it in the graphs actually. Like when you look at schooling, it kind of rises even after somewhat because the, I mean it takes time until the policy completely kicks in. Yeah. When, when you have this big jump in the number of people going to middle school, is there a problem of the capacity of the buildings and the, the numbers of teachers? Actually, we looked at in the other paper, mm -hmm. uh, they, like the number of teachers were increased, and in terms of capacity, like they combined the schools, and they were very much prepared for that because you know the policy was for that purpose. But the other thing is in high school. In high school, enrollment rates also increased in graph, but in high schools, the number of teachers were the same because they didn't probably think about that, that, that the high school enrollments would also increase. Well, we better let you <laughs> okay. present your results. Okay. Hold that. A question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, as I told you, we look at the level effects and timing effects. We, these are your family. The, quantum and tempo effects, basically. Uh, the first one is uh, level effects, uh, quantum effects by running logit regressions. The other one is uh, duration analysis for tempo effects. In the duration analysis, in the marriage case, the woman enters the risk set at age 10. In the first word case, the woman enters the risk set at age 12. And these and stay in the risk set until they get married or first birth. It could be also right censored if she is younger than 21 at the time of the survey. Uh, that could be right censoring. We use a piece piece by constant uh, baseline hazard. So basically, the hazard is allowed to change by each age level. Uh, basically, we use a very flexible form, the most flexible form. So results, I'll go faster on results. Obviously first we need to look at the effect on education. This is for men and this is for women. These are odds ratios and the results are huge as you see. At age six, seven and eight, let's look at for females. At age six, seven and eight, the odds ratios, this is the odds ratio. Basically how much the probability of going over the probability of not going jumps. Like, it's very strong from 6 to 8, but the effect is, there's also an effect afterwards. It's smaller, but there's a statistically significant <coughs> effect afterwards as well. And we see the effect for both men and women. Actually, for men, the spillover effects, the effects after age 9 is stronger. Actually, maybe the predicted probabilities is going to make it clear. These are the predicted ones. Using the previous regression, using this regression results, I predict, this is for 1987 birth cohort. This is what, their, what the probability of schooling would be if there was no policy. This is what the probability of completing that year of school with the policy. For, let's look at women, like for grade eight, secondary school. It goes up from 52% to 84%. Like a very big jump. Even later, like this is grade 11, like almost high school, high school, it goes up from 41 to 47. For men, 
it is from 10 percentage point increase, even though this was not mandatory. Okay? So we have this huge effects on education, which we're going to use to identify the effect on marriage. Now let's look at the effects on marriage and first birth. These are like separate regressions at each age. Like we take age 11, run a logit regression. At each age, these come from separate regressions. The difference between the samples is that your point, here we get rid of 86, 87 birth cohorts, the ones in, in the between, the fuzziness. Here we get rid of 81, 85, 86, 87, and 88. We get, of, get rid of the middle birth cohorts. Okay, because the policy is not sharp. With the original sample, we find the effect on the probability of being married until age 16. So the policy decreases <coughs> the odds of being married by like 30% by age 16. It decreases the odds of being married by 70% by age 30. Obviously the effect is even stronger early on because here they are forced to be in school. Here the incarceration effect is even stronger. And the magnitudes are even stronger. Like if when I get rid of fuzziness, in this case, actually these are better results, we find the effect until age 18. So, so I guess I'm with Ron on this. I'd sort of like to see sample D where you at least allow that thing to be like a quadratic. Yeah, I could add that. Uh, Shouldn't change it too much. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, in this case, it wouldn't. Even change. with a fair amount of fuzziness, you got to be able to allow some. Yeah. some more I mean, as I said, I'm kind of very comfortable with the linear effect because the graphs look quite linear as well in this case. But yeah, sample D could be quadratic with this. Um, in this case, again, we find an effect until age 18. So the probability of being married by uh, the odds decreases by 25 percent. So if I show you the, yeah, the, uh, these are for fertility, for time to first birth, okay? So this is whether the woman has given any birth by that age. The effect of the policy decreases the probability of giving birth by age 19 by 25%. It decreases the odds by 25%. And again, the effect is stronger at earlier ages. And here, with the getting rid of the middle ones, the effects are even stronger. So again, these, these are the actual, you know, these are easier to understand. So this is the fraction that is predicted to be married without the policy. This is the fraction that is predicted to be married with the policy, okay? And as you see, by age 16, the, pro the policy decreases the fraction that is married from 7.4% to 4.6. This is like something like almost 40%. Well, and here, this is more than 20%. Well. Like these amounts are huge compared to the estimates for developed countries for Sweden or the US. For the US, the biggest effect that they could find by age 19 is less than 10%. Obviously, in a developing country case, uh, this. Uh, I'm going to discuss why we could have bigger effects. Um, and for marriage, for giving birth, you see by age 17 it goes down from 4.6 to 2.6, and by age uh, 19 from 16.2 to 11. Point. So the, we find very strong effects. So the next thing is a falsification test. This could also fit to your concern about linearity. Like if there's something wrong with the empirical strategy, then let's look at the effect of the uh, policy that didn't exist. Okay? What we I do is, I take 54 to 84 birth cohorts. None of these are affected by the policy. Okay? And I suppose that there was a policy in 1977. Like, I take everything 10 years back. Instead of 87, I suppose that there was a policy in 77. Okay? For girls who are not really affected. And I do, I carry out the same econometric analysis. So this is what we get with the falsification. This is what we get in the actual case. Okay? In the falsification, again, we get negative numbers. 
Sometimes it's actually in one case at age 16 for first one, it's even significant, but compared to these coefficients, the falsification is like almost zero. Okay? So this is the same thing with a policy that is not supposed to affect, and in fact it doesn't affect. And this is the policy that is supposed to affect, and it has a huge impact. So the next thing is duration analysis. Why, like after this, why do we need duration analysis? One thing is here, we find strong effects by age 18, but is it that earlier effects persist until here, or that there are negative effects even at these ages? One thing we can look at is that, okay? The other thing we can look at is compare the effect of the magnitudes by age. So these are the results of time to first birth, time to first marriage, sorry. Again, three samples. What we see is that with the initial sample, we find the effect until age 16. But with the better, clean, cleaner sample, I should say, we see that even at age 17 and 18, the policy has an effect on the probability of getting married conditional on not getting married until that age, okay? Even at age 17 and 18, the policy is still kicking. And it's not a surprise because in the schooling outcomes, I showed that the policy affected schooling at these ages as well. Because of the spillover effects, the incarceration effect still works at these ages, okay? Because of the spillover effects in schooling. But as you might expect, like, if you look at the magnitudes, the effect of the policy is stronger at early ages. At age 10 to 14, which is really the new compulsory years, the effect is much stronger. Afterwards, the effect persists, but it's relatively weaker. Like, these odds ratios, like, it's lower than one means it's even stronger. And that's the same thing for time to first birth, again, the effect of the policy stays until age 19. These are like policy affected with the ages. So but the outcome variable here is, is, is uh, for every completion or is it current uh, rate? Or? Basically, it's like probably to, it's giving birth at yeah. this age, yeah. conditional on not giving birth until that age. Okay, so it's a conditional probability. It's a, yeah. It's a, hazard, it's a hazard rate, yeah. So, so, like, the thing is, it's not that the earlier effects are persisting, but the effects are still working on at late ages, at a lower magnitude. Though. And the final thing, this is the final result, like, this effect on fertility, right? We found this effect on fertility. This effect on, I should say, first birth, time to first birth. It could happen in two ways. The policy could be delaying the time until marriage, or the policy could be delaying the time until first birth after marriage, right? Well, for the first one, the policy affecting the time until marriage, we obviously have evidence. But does the policy affect the time until first birth after marriage. In this case, the woman enters the risk set when she gets married. Now the clock starts ticking when she gets married. And we do the same analysis after she gets married. And the interesting thing is with the larger sample and the smaller sample, we didn't have this, but the larger sample, we even find an effect on the time to first birth after the woman is, gets married. This is also quite interesting because this is something that we cannot explain by the incarceration effects. Now these women are out of the school. Yeah, they are out. They are already married. So incarceration effect could not, the institution effect could not explain this. In this case, there needs to be some sort of human capital effect. Like maybe they know contraceptives better or like the opportunity cost of staying at home um, instead of working is higher. So they delay their time to first work. Uh, this is the next slide, right? Oh, so, sorry, I got it. Yeah, this is, in this case, they delay the time uh, to the first work after marriage. 
So basically that's uh, to conclude. So, uh, we find uh, that this extension of compulsory schooling had a negative effect on uh, marriage and first work decisions. Basically it delayed the marriage and first work decisions. And the interesting thing is, uh, during the extended compulsory schooling years, we would expect this anyway. But we, but we find that the effect persists even after the uh, years beyond compulsory schooling years. So even after age 14, 15, when they are not free, uh, they, we still find the effect. And this is not surprising in a way because we see that the uh, spillover effects in education, because of the spillover effects in education, many are still in school after age 14 or 15. And the other critical thing is we find huge effects. Like by age uh, 16, the probability of marriage goes down by 38%. By age 18, the probability of marriage goes down by a fifth. But these are much bigger than what is reported for the world countries. Similar numbers for, for, to, for first work, not to reiterate. So in terms of interpretation, how do we interpret these effects in terms of uh, the theories? So obviously, there is a strong institutional or incarceration effect. Uh, uh, time until marriage or first work is delayed because these girls are forced to stay in school. But we also find evidence of a human capital effect because we find that the policy also changes the time until first birth after marriage. So once these girls are out and they get married, they still have kids later. So this shows that there is also a human capital effect, at least in the decision until first birth. Obviously the limitations are that because of like currently we cannot look at the level of the lifetime level effects, whether it's going to affect them in terms of marry or not marry decision until age 50, let's say, or the total fertility decisions, the number of kids that they have. Maybe they are getting married later, but maybe they can make it up in terms of the total number of kids. So we need to wait 20 more years to answer those <laughs> questions because the policy is recent. I mean, we cannot go beyond the age 21 with this data. In your very last sentence there about the uh, time until first birth after marriage uh, indicates a human capital effect, but there is actually, you mentioned at least three different channels by which that might have occurred. It could be knowledge of contraception, which is not a human capital effect. It could be a change in the tastes of the woman from an uneducated woman to an educated woman, her taste may change, period, aside from all economic or uh, wage effects. I mean, I'm interpreting them as like human capital effect in the sense that, you know, education changes their mm -hmm. preferences or their knowledge in that sense and human capital effect, not like a human capital effect in the market, okay. but human capital effect in terms of preferences or knowledge. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to get yeah think about reasons why it might include these women to delay their age of first birth. Um, and I'm wondering if you've seen, if you've looked at all at whether or not they work when they finish schooling, or what are they doing that is maybe not compatible with having children? Actually, um, we have been also looking at the actual labor force participation rates of females have been really low in Turkey. But there are also very, very strong cohort effects. Like for these women, labor force participation rates are really jumping. Like, so for this woman, it could be different that they are really entering the labor force. There are very strong cohort effects in, in, female, in urban areas in female labor force participation. Uh, one thing you didn't mention is where the locus of decision making tends to be in terms of deciding on the timing of marriage for girls. These are young girls you're talking about. So we presume that generally it's parental decisions, family decisions. And so in a sense, some of the models, Easterland and so on, that you mm -hmm. posed earlier, they, they imply individual decision making. But here, it's more here so. you're looking at, at more decision making focused in the family on the marriage decision. Maybe then it shifts a little bit more toward the couple 
in the first birth decision, right? So you're, you're mm. kind of getting. They different. I think they they are not in the same realm. Yeah, you know, I didn't think like that. In the marriage decisions, the decision maker is really the parents, yeah. but in the first part of the marriage decision, the decision Shift maker. Shifts a bit. I'm sure the family has a lot to say about mm -hmm. when they want the daughter-in-law to have a. Yeah, but birth, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. But they, I don't know whether you know approximately what what's what may be happening in Turkey with respect to um, declines in the sort of familial arranged marriage and movement toward more uh, balanced choice or total choice of the young people. But that's yeah. a young age you're talking about. Yeah, but so yeah, that's like that's yeah. pretty much familial, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we were first. Oh, she was first. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was wondering, you had mentioned in there some of the data that you had was in terms of some ethnicity measuring the mother's tongue or. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Did you find any effects? To yeah, that? yeah, actually, um, I looked at that. Uh, like for Kurds, uh, the effects are really stronger at early ages, like 13, 14, 15. And many of the early ages are in the eastern part for Kurdish ethnicity. And it, in, in, in consistent with that at early ages, the effect is stronger for Kurds. At later ages, 17, 18, the effect is stronger on ethnic Turks. Some, that's something that I'm still thinking about how to incorporate. Actually, at, at the beginning, I showed you the effect was stronger when mothers have lower levels of schooling. Actually, I'm planning to add something, these econometric results separately for those groups. Because with regression discontinuity, you compare before and after. But by doing that, you also compare groups. Like one group is affected more by the policy, and you would expect the effect on marriage to be stronger, right? And if I can show that, then it adds, it makes it even more stronger. So would the ethnic curves have to be more rural, or would they be more something else? Or? Well, overall, they would be more rural, but uh, not necessarily now, a lot of living urban areas as well. And religious-wise, are there? Religion-wise, yeah, the religion could be an important issue because we have this minority group, uh, but there's no data on that, like Alevis, and they are kind of progressive and they would be expected to have fewer kids, but uh, there's no data for that. So thank you. This is lovely and very, very interesting. I'm, I'm a little, su I'm surprised by the, by the magnitude of these results um, because they, they, they are, as you say, astonishingly high. Um, in fact, they're high enough that they suggest that there's almost no selection driving um, overall differences in fertility by education. Since most of the, like in, if you look at DHS data for most of Saharan Africa, you get estimates of, you know, you get, you get. For a certain group. If you, if you look at if you look at the if you just prote if you just look raw, doing nothing fancy, just crude, looking at fertility of educated versus uneducated, you get numbers in this magnitude. You have know, 30, 40 percent declines for um, some secondary compared to to um, incomplete primary, for example, in many sub-Saharan African countries. And so it, the, this suggests that there's essentially no selection in those data, that, that it's all cause if your number, if these are right, which is, which is fantastic. That's I mean, in that sense, this, like, this affected a huge chunk of the population. Mm -hmm. like, many, like the problem with these studies, like in economics, there is this thing about average treatment effect versus local. Sure. Like, in the developed the countries, they estimated for a very subsection of the population because they change, they are affected by the policy. Yeah. Here, like it affects a really big chunk. So we really get some kind of net closer to the estimate for the whole country. Right. So, so following up on that, uh, you, 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 could, you could just test this. So yeah. take, take one of the variables that you like. Like I take probability of first birth at 21. Mm -hmm. That's about half your sample. To set up as linear probability model, estimate it using no LS, which mm -hmm. is your idea from Africa, and then hit this thing with an IV. And the, I, the IV would be the compulsory school law, but, but you could do better than that. You've got the compulsory school law interacting with the parents' education, which is where you're going to get a lot of the traction. 
And so, so that that first day is just gonna. That's it. Next, actually, that's the only missing table right now. <laughs> I showed you the motivation at the beginning. What I'm planning to do is write that. You know, interact uh, policy with schooling, mother schooling, and see if the policy really has a higher kick for uh, girls with low mothers. Well, so that'd be, the, that'd be the first stage, but then, then the second stage would allow you to compare the OLS with the IV estimate, which would allow you to test whether or not, if, if that coefficient doesn't bump much, then it's telling you that the local average treatment effect is about the same as the observed. The thing is I can't really do a real IV type of estimation. Um, I mean, not like a two SLS thing. One problem is the censoring problem. Uh, the thing is like schooling are not completed for these children. Like the schooling variable is censored. The other issue is that I didn't want to go to two stage least squares because here like you're not really affecting the only female decision, uh, female schooling. It affects male schooling as well. That could be But that is I mean you don't you don't get around that with this I mean, it, our RD doesn't change that. I mean, the, this thing here, at least I don't claim that I find the effect of uh, giving girls a year more of education. I just say that this is the intent to treat effect. This is the effect of the policy. I just claim that I find the effect of the policy. I don't claim to find the effect of giving girls one more years of schooling. Fair, fair enough, but it's still, still we get to, to... Yeah, but I mean, in terms of like comparing groups, I think that's that's an important thing, comparing groups and Do you know if these uh, young women have older sisters or not? Yeah, yeah. We, we have, them. have you have you thought about how uh, emulating using your older sister as a role model affects these adults? Uh, so whether the girl's decision could change by whether or not they have an elder sister, huh? No, we didn't think about that. It's just a thought. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm imagining this uh, compulsory schooling was introduced with a lot of discussion in the media and arguments about why it was important and so on. How do we... Timing, timing How do we figure out whether it's exactly. e all that discussion and publicity and argument and public relations and so on uh, might not have had these kinds of effects Actually. even without, and in particular at those older ages I'm wondering about, and if, if there is something broader like that, then it's possible it might affect fertility of other women um, who haven't themselves gotten more schooling, but they get the idea, oh, this this education thing is for real, and we better start thinking about uh, the costs of educating our children mm -hmm. now and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. There might be some things that you look at. First point is really important, basically, you know, whether the, pol the timing of the policy is exogenous to these things. Actually, this is also interesting. This thing was discussed for a long time, like maybe it's from 80s, 70s, 80s, like extended for a very long time, like decades. But the exact timing had to do with the political developments. Like in mid 19s, there was this kind of religious government, and the, like the enrollment in religious schools were rising. Then, with the, by the push of the military, the government changed. A secular government came, and the secular government, just to prevent girls and boys attending religious schools after age five, uh, grade five basically kicked in the policy because in that way they could delay them going to religious school until age uh, 15. So it was very political. The timing was completely political. Actually now they are trying to reverse the policy. Now there's a religious government. Now it's <laughs> like it would be basically this policy could go back as well. In terms of the second point, other women, we, yeah, we didn't we look at that, whether it has effect. But in this case, we are doing that in a way, right? Because we're comparing courts that are not affected by the policy with the courts. I mean, if there's an effect like you said, we wouldn't, the, at least the effect would be smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Because you make, you're affecting more of them. Mm -hmm. At least we know like differential effect mm -hmm. by you. Okay, I think we'd better end. Thank you very much.